Hi, I'm Andy, and in this video we'll be exploring how to attack, detect, and defend against component object model hijacking. Component object model, or COM for short, is a framework which enables interactions between various software components. It allows software A to access functionality from software B. The entity which holds the desired functionality is referred to as the COM server, and the entity which is requesting the functionality is the COM client, even though these are two software components running on the same machine. A quick side note, a related technology, distributed COM, allows for COM interactions across the network, but it's out of the scope of this video. COM components are identified by a class ID, which is a pseudo-randomly generated, globally unique identifier. COM can be used to embed one application's functionality within another. For example, the ability to embed an Excel sheet within a Word document. Or a Word document in an Excel sheet, if you really want to. Numerous aspects of system functionality exist as COM components, allowing various parts of the operating system to call them. One of these is the audio-related interfaces. This allows the code to be written once, but called anywhere. The COM interface means that third-party software applications can also call these pieces of system functionality. Firefox is one such application, which calls the IMM device enumerator interface when it starts up, in order to discover what sound devices are present on the system, so that it knows where to send an audio stream if a user navigates to a website which has multimedia content. Parts of Windows also define COM interface standards, which, if a third-party developer follows, allows them to create components which extend the default behavior of the Windows interface. For example, the right-click menu items provided by 7-Zip, or the sync status icons provided by cloud storage services. In this scenario, the third-party developed code is the COM server, and the Windows Explorer shell is the COM client. When a client wants to access a COM component, it makes a call to the Windows API function co-create instance, including the class ID desired. Windows checks the registry under hkclasses root to locate where the code for this component resides. Once it's located the path and file name of the DLL file, Windows creates an instance of the DLL and calls DLL get class object to retrieve a pointer to the object. This is passed back to the requesting application, which then calls a series of interface functions to actually perform the actions that it wants. COM is a deeply embedded part of the Windows operating system and can provide a means of establishing persistence on a machine once it's been compromised by an attacker. There's several different flavors of this attack and we'll walk through each in turn. Firstly, an attacker may craft a malicious COM component and register it in such a way that it's executed on startup or in response to a specific event. A common method involves the creation of a shell extension for Windows, such as the right-click menu options or icon overlay, which we saw in the introduction. Here's an example of a malicious shell extension, which acts like a right-click menu extension. Once registered, Explorer will run the code inside it every time the user right-clicks a file. In this example, there's no obvious adverse behavior observed by the user, but behind the scenes, the malicious shell extension is exfiltrating a copy of every right-clicked file over to an attacker-controlled machine. Although this could just as easily be doing any other malicious action, such as crypto-locking files or re-establishing a command and control connection to an attacker. Remember from the intro section that COM components are identified by their class ID, and that the co-create object API call looks up the mapping to the right DLL file via the hkclasses root registry hive. Well, hkclasses root is actually a merge of the entries in hkcurrentuser and hkcurrentmachine. Most genuine COM objects get installed in hkLocalMachine so that they're available system-wide for any user. However, the entries in hkCurrentUser take precedent, 
so an attacker can place an entry to their own malicious DLL here, causing it to be run instead of the real COM component. As the name suggests, adjustments to HKeyCurrent user are only effective for the current user, but have an advantage for an attacker of being modifiable by a standard non-privileged user. Local admin rights are not required. A simple test malicious payload can be created with Metasploit's MSF Venom command. This one will create a reverse shell back to the attacker's machine. Once on a victim's machine, an attacker just needs to create a key under HKey Current User Software Classes Class ID, which has the same ID as a commonly used component, and point it towards the malicious DLL. This example is targeting the class ID of IMM Device Enumerator, which we saw in the introduction. This is called by many apps, including Firefox. So if our victim tries to load Firefox now, it launches a reverse shell back to the attacker. The problem with this example is that the malicious component doesn't do any of the functions expected of it, so it effectively breaks Firefox and prevents it from loading. This makes it obvious that something is wrong, leading to a higher chance of discovery. A smarter solution involves a more elegant payload like this, which is a combination of DevFrog's C++ reverse shell and Leo Lubeck's ComProxy POC. When a client tries to instantiate a COM object, the reverse shell is launched, and at the same time, it creates an instance of the original, genuine COM component and hands this back to the client. Once the registry entry under HKeyCurrentUser is updated to point towards this new, more refined payload, if our victim launches Firefox again, everything looks like it's working normally, but in fact has suddenly established that reverse shell back to the attacker. As always, this payload could do any one of a number of different nasties, and is not limited to just a reverse shell. Some applications may not know the class ID of the component that they want to call, but instead know the more friendly looking prog ID identifier. An API call to class ID from prog ID fetches the class ID, but this too is vulnerable to hijack in a similar way, by creating an entry under HKeyCurrentUser to link the genuine prog ID with the class ID of a malicious component. Yet another COM hijack method involves setting an object to trigger Windows into treating any reference to one component as a reference to a different component. Here, the malicious hijack observed in the previous attacks is being given a new class ID. This effectively undoes the hijack. Next, a new key is created which matches the class ID of the target component. In this case, it's for IMM device enumerator again. But instead of specifying a DLL, a new key called treat as is created, which in turn is assigned the value of the malicious class ID. Now, if the victim tries to load up Firefox again, Windows will follow the treat as request and load up the malicious payload again. And if that wasn't enough, another variant of COM hijacking targets orphaned COM references which may get left over after the installation and subsequent uninstallation of an application. If the uninstall application fails to tidy up properly, then an attacker can place a malicious DLL in the location where the original genuine DLL was located, although this may not always be feasible due to file system permissions. David Toulis of NCC Labs includes a function to search for orphaned class IDs amongst a suite of PowerShell tools for COM hijacking. There's a link in the video description to the GitHub page to grab a copy of this, along with links to his 2019 DarbyCon talk on the subject. Registry entries for COM components should change very infrequently, and only in response to software installs or updates. Therefore, registry monitoring can be an effective mechanism to detect the registration of a new malicious COM component. As I've covered in previous videos, turning this on requires a policy configuration to activate object auditing, and then specifying which keys and values you want to monitor in registry editor. 
Remember that most valid COM components are installed for system-wide use, and so it's rare to see registrations on a per-user basis. So, special attention should be given to monitoring for new items in HKEY current user, software, classes, class ID, as these could very well be hijack attempts. Once registry monitoring is configured, altered values can be observed in the Windows event log. Some threat intelligence sources cite specific malicious class IDs associated with an attack or threat actor, so monitoring for these in particular can be advantageous. Actually preventing COM hijacking is impractical, as COM is such a fundamental system feature. A better approach is to focus on the detection of potential hijack through monitoring, as discussed in the previous section, and ensure it's followed up by robust investigation. It's also worth noting that COM hijacking cannot stand alone. An attacker will have to have used other techniques to gain an initial foothold or laterally move onto a device before undertaking COM hijacking to gain persistence. And similarly, we'll use the persistence delivered by COM hijacking to undertake further lateral movement or action on their objectives. So, Adding defensive measures against other techniques can help slow or prevent an attack at a different stage of the attack chain, even if it's not possible to prevent COM hijacking itself. It may also be worth undertaking an assessment for orphaned class IDs using the PowerShell script mentioned in the attack section and conducting a tidy up, especially if orphaned entries point to directories which are writable by users. That about wraps up this video. If you found it useful, please do give it a like and consider subscribing if you want more of this sort of content. Drop a note in the comments if there's anything you think I've missed around attacking, detecting and defending against the abuse of COM hijacking, or if you have a good idea of what topic I should cover next. I'll see you next time.